I'm Alex Hirsch, the creator of Gravity Falls. Hey, I'm Mike Aranda. I was the creative director. Hi, I'm Rob Branzetti. I was the supervising producer. Uh, the the best supervising producer ever. I have to say, this is the first episode we have Rob on, and like Hello. Robbie, Ro- Bobby Renzabi, Bobby yeah. Renzabs. <laughs> um, me, Mike, and Rob sort of constituted the kind of brain trust of the series um, for many of the many of the long late night hours working in animatics. Um, and uh, I just want to mention a little bit about sort of our dynamic on the series, which you might hear of a little bit in this, is <laughs> that. Um, Mike, Mike Rianda always wanted to change everything all the time. Yeah. <laughs> like, he would be willing the day before the, the thing was due to be like, let's beat it. Let's do a better story. <laughs> um, and Rob is like sane and rational and very smart and has and worked my on my arch nemesis <laughs> <laughs> and has worked on like many classic cartoons. Like he's the only person who'd ever made anything before. That's true. Like Rob has worked on all these amazing cartoons and created my life as a teenage robot and worked on my little pony and worked on Powerpuff Girls. And so he actually knows how to make a show. Yeah. And so Rob we were just gallivanting children yeah, so, <laughs> in front of him. So, so Rob would be, you know, Mike would be like, let's change everything. And Rob would be like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Th- this is a production. How about let's be a little bit more conservative, but let's be tactical with our adjustments so that we're both fixing the episode, but also not like destroying everyone's lives. Um, and I was always sort of someone in between. Like yeah, I, yeah. I, I shared Mike's insanity and like pressure for perfection, and Rob's like pragmatism um, and like logical left brain way of thinking. Well, because at some point you need to make a show. Yeah, at some <laughs> point a show needs to be made. So they were kind of like the angel and the devil on my shoulder, <laughs> depending on the argument. But like I always found like if me and Mike agree and Rob disagrees, I'm gonna do it. If me and Rob agree and Mike disagrees, I'm gonna do it. If Rob and Mike agree on something that I disagree on, I'm going to like take a second thought of it. Like there was a, pro- yeah, I had yeah, like yeah. a flow chart of decision making. Yeah. And if we I'm all like, agreed, it was perfect. If, oh, if, we, yeah, if we all agreed, there was no voice in the studio that could stop us. Yeah. This right. idea is going in. Yeah. Um, like, and it's, it's nice to get the band back together. It's yeah, been, hey. it's been a long time. So it's very useful. Hand the rocks, the Mabel. Let's actually hey. talk about the episode. It's this an was episode. The first episode. <laughs> <laughs> this is the first episode. Uh, the point of this uh, with Gideon, the point of this episode was to introduce Gideon who, the entire origin of Gideon came from a postcard my mom sent me while I was <laughs> developing the series. Um, you can Google it. It's there's this little child. I think I don't know if it's an urban legend or if it was real, but it was a oh. child preacher named Larry Larrymore. It's very um, disturbing. And it's this <laughs> hilarious picture of this doughy little kid holding a Bible, wearing a blue suit, oh, and God. it was such a funny image. And she was like, "Oh, maybe some idea for your show." And I was like, "That's the villain." Yeah, I, I didn't know that your he mom said, said that to you. That's amazing. Message. Yeah, that like, is amazing. The moment I saw that image, I was like. That is so fitting with the spirit of the show, this oh, yeah. idea of tourist attractions, roadside attractions, this thing that feels like it's from an old postcard. And just the idea of Stan, who I was in the process of inventing as just this super grumpy, in-control character, the idea of him getting foiled left and right by this little... Yes. Well, look at him. Look at him. He's, <laughs> he's delightful. Um, yeah. like <laughs> th- delightful. That was just... It, it cracked me up, and it seemed like he'd be a longtime rival, and we were trying to come up with a story around him. And I think it was a Dan McGrath, who was our story editor at the time, who had, had a lot to sort of contribute to this idea that, like, it w- he would have a crush on Mabel, maybe. Um, yeah. That this would be a way to enter that, that character. Tom, Tom yeah. Saunders was in the mix, too. He, it, it, one of the nice things of, that, that they came up with was just giving it a lot of shifting dynamics. The story had a lot of turns where it was like, Stan all of a sudden formed an alliance with Bud Gleeful, and Mabel was in love with Gideon, and Gideon had a problem with Dipper. And it made it a really easy episode to write rather yeah. than a lot of them because it we, there was a n- lot of juicy character meat. Yeah. Um, unlike some episodes, which was like kind of 11 minutes stretched into 22 minutes. Yeah. Sure. This was one of our first episodes where we really had a lot of layered A and B plots and the entire town was getting in on it. Yeah. Um, and I think we, we learned a lot from you know our fellow writers about like how to, how to construct stuff. I got to give a shout out, of course, to Thurp Van Orman. Woo! Thurup. He really embodies his character. <laughs> Thurup was uh, the first boss I ever had in my life. So my boss was Little Gideon. My first <laughs> job was on a TV show called Flapjack on Cartoon Network. And I would hear, I'd be working in my office and I'd hear like, you know, I've got a few notes on that. And I'd, <laughs> I'd always think like, is, it bring, yeah, yeah, yeah. is it bring your kid to work day? And then I'd pop out and be like, oh, it's my boss Thurup. Um, he's this little dude with a giant beard and a bigger heart. Yeah. Um, and that's his real voice. He yes. sounds like this. He's yes. an adult man it's with a little cute baby voice. But I, the one thing it's say about Thurup is like 
Flapjack is the best example of what Thurup is, and this yes. is kind of like a tweaked version of what Thurup could become if he went down <laughs> that darker road. Like, yep. I can see Thurup capable of being Gideon. He's not. He's a much nicer man <laughs> and a much nicer person than Gideon could ever be. He's such a sweetheart. Um, but but, but there, it's in there. <laughs> <laughs> there is darkness in his heart. Am I wrong? Am I being unfair? <laughs> no, I absolutely. I, I told him, uh, when, when I first <laughs> talked to him about doing this voice for the show, I said, hey, hey Thurup, it's me, your old board artist from Flapjack. I remember your voice. It was amazing. I want you to voice this evil little baby. Um, and I actually told him <laughs> to do an impression of one of our uh, executives who we love, uh, Khaki Jones. Oh, yeah. Who's, who's a phenomenal <laughs> oh, executive. Yeah. Khaki's um, the best. One of the best we've ever worked with and you know was also a uh, big at Cartoon Network um, and she's from Georgia and she has the southern accent yeah. and I was like Thurup just be khaki and he's like oh like this and I was like <laughs> Gideon is born yeah. That's yeah. khaki was so great because she was always like she was like I just love the cartoons that you guys make. They're wonderful. <laughs> and it's like, she was like this sweet mom, but she was also crazy smart. Yeah. So yeah. she would give great notes, but also have this like supportive energy. Yes. And it was, oh, it and was she'd also have these cute nice. little Southernisms like, well, that's just cuckoo bananas. And we, <laughs> some of the things that like Gideon says, like I was inspired yeah, by totally. like those, those sweet Southernisms. Um, I got, I got to give credit to, uh, I think I think these were Zach Pia's jokes. Um, he was mm -hmm. one of our funniest writers, and this idea of Mabel getting creepily made over, <laughs> yeah. um, like I I was inspired by that. I late in the script added the bedazzled joke because I was inspired by Zach's crazy makeover jokes. <laughs> I think the part of what's key to Mabel and it's ex exa examined here in this episode is like even when she's doing girly things, she's doing them in a weird, distorted way that is not typically girly. So the fact that she's excited about having claws like a wild animal and you know when she puts these super long nails on it says a lot about who she is y yeah. yeah you know it's something that i never really thought about when when we were doing this like i was just trying to be inspired by my weird real sister yeah and so my recollection of my weird real sister was that she added weird real confusing perspectives to everything and so when we'd get scripts and mabel was acting if she ever seemed like she was just acting sort of stereotypically reductively girly or feminine yeah yeah um, like I would rainbows like, and unicorns right i'd be like well yeah. there's more to it than that she's a, yeah. it's a weird mabel version yeah um, but you know I, I think most of our writers were able to really quickly loop into that and once you have heard christian shawl's voice you know where the comedy's coming from yeah, yeah. And this this was a rare episode where we actually got them in the booth at the same time, and they yes. were able to talk to each other, and it was so funny. And it's like it would be great if we could do that on every single episode. It yeah, is, it's yeah, very rare. It's hard to get, especially when you have celebrity voices. It's hard to get their schedules to line up. But I always think it's better when you have them in 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 there at the same time. You just get a dynamic if that you, you can. can't get otherwise. Yeah, yeah. This was also I have to mention this was the very first episode boarded uh this is the first boarding job i think professionally ever done by alonzo ramirez and uh, oh. ramos and matt brawley yeah. um both who've gone on to become directors uh both yeah. have won awards for their work yeah um and we we kind of i'll give us credit i'll <laughs> i'll pat my i'll pat us on the back <laughs> yeah. if you hear slapping on that's us patting each other on the back for, we <laughs> yeah just, we, we, we found them kids out of school yeah and no, they, uh, were great. they were very new and they did an amazing job yeah. on this first yeah. episode yeah. and they were so good right off the bat um, like I think we weren't sure if we were going to hire them as storyboard artists we wanted to start them as revisionists and then we realized we did we just needed board artists yes. so yeah. we like we pre-promoted them based yes. on just a good <laughs> thank faith. god we did um, and it was the <laughs> best god. decision we were ever forced to make <laughs> it's, it's funny because uh, watching these episodes again, like it's very clear when Alonzo scenes come on and, yeah. and Brawley as well. But Alonzo just had a very particular way of drawing the characters and overseas could never quite match the charm, but it's, it's there. It's bleeding through. Yeah. Um, and yeah a little bit gets through. These yeah. are all Alonzo drawings. Yeah. Like they're more pushed. And, yeah. and also the other thing that I was impressed with with Brawley, cause it's like, I've never, because it's like, you know, when you write something and then you see it boarded, generally you have all these notes. You're like, oh, wait, well, well maybe you could stage a different, uh, my vision. <laughs> <laughs> but like, Brawley, I was so impressed. Like, every time, every joke, bam, boarded perfectly the first time. Yeah. Like, I mean, even on a script driven show, there's so much open to interpretation by the board artist. Yeah. Every way, every scene is framed and everything is posed. Like, 
it can go wrong a million ways. I got to I got to call out that um that wouldn't it be funny if we walked in a closet but it was yeah. a real door. That that's another that's, <laughs> that's a Zach Pyatt yeah. joke. And Zach all I was, the way. I love that joke because well, I was like he understands Seuss. Like cuz like a lot of people think oh Seuss is just stupid. But in yeah. my mind like he's not stupid. No. He kind of exists in his own television show in his mind. Yeah, yeah. yeah. exactly. Right? And so he's he's actually kind of trope savvy Yeah. and he's just like oh I think we got to set up for a classic <laughs> gag here. <laughs> and it's like everyone's like this is reality Seuss. Yeah, what, yeah. <laughs> what are you doing? Well, actually, Seuss is that therefore the smartest character on the show in a way. because he knows he's a. <laughs> oh, a I have to mention way. that moment where Stan walks up to that picture and says, "Oh, this, this is beautiful." <laughs> I don't know if you're aware that's become a meme. Oh, really? I've seen wow. hundreds of. They'll just put whatever the flavor of the month they meme is. That they'll put it in the frame and it'll be him saying, "Oh, this, this is beautiful." <laughs> that's <laughs> that's amazing. That was based on uh, one of my friends growing up had this horrifying clown painting in the like. If we stayed the night at his at his house, there'd be this psychotic clown painting on the wall and we'd all be like what is your mom's problem dude <laughs> it's there's no clown painting that is not psychotic <laughs> have you ever seen a successfully done clown painting this, this clown painting is beautiful <laughs> oh, come on oh exquisite <laughs> like, look can... at the tears on his bulbous grease <laughs> like, painted face uh, i'm not i'm not someone who thinks like clowns are inherently creepy or clowns are incredibly funny that all the time wrong. they are <laughs> well see that's yes i know people hold that opinion but like <laughs> A clown in person can be one of those things, but like clowns rendered in a one <laughs> step removed art, there's no there's no point to it. There's no point. Uh, this is me doing my. I was before this on a Disney show called Fish Hooks, where I did the voice of a teenage <laughs> clam named Clamantha. I thought you were about to say this is me doing my Iago. Uh, <laughs> my. No, that's Joe Pitt drawing basically Iago and me doing <laughs> Clamantha. I'm a clam. <laughs> that's. I still get royalties for that. <laughs> well, as well you should. He's fanning himself with money right I now for the don't. kids at home. Yeah. You can't see this, but I'm actually up to my neck in money. I, I don't record unless I'm in my money tub. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's really gross, guys. Uh, one th one thing about this scene that I remember is that like I I was like really adamantly against this French waiter. I was like, no, that's unobserved. That's something that you, you only see in TV shows. And Alex is like, no, no, no. no. I'll just make it so stupid, it'll loop back around to being funny. And Alex's voice for the guy was like, wee wee! And because he was so intense, it made like, it like pushed past the trope and made it funny again. <laughs> but Mike also, just for um, our sound engineer right now, uh, Mike's voice is so loud that it's broken <laughs> microphones. So I apologize to anyone who's listening on Mike like on Mike's, yeah, or on headphones. Because like Mike, there's something wrong with Mike's voice. No, where it's no, like no, louder. You guys than, love it. Back love away, it, guys. Back Trust away me. from the television. Go to another room. You want this evening to last, my sweet? No. I mean, yes. I mean, I'm always happy to hang out with a friend, buddy, pal, chum. Other word for friend. Pal. I always said pal. Uh, mate. How about soulmate? Well, you can't say no to that. Man, he's so nice, but I can't keep doing this. But I can't break his heart. Ah, I have no way out. What in the heck happened? So th this, the plot of this episode was actually something that I, I struggled with. I, I like. I was having a hard time. That 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 line about being pulled in the romance zone. Right, that's a, that's right. an Ori Wallington line. I give her credit for that because that's a, an observed thing about what it's like to deal with with a suitor that you don't want. Um, but I, I was having a hard time with this plot because my version of Mabel in my head was somebody who's very confident. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the idea that she would have a hard time telling somebody no was something that we invented to come up with a plot. Like we yeah. needed a story, and so we said, well, maybe that's her problem. Um, and for a while. I was having a hard time believing it, um, yeah. and I, I have to give Dan McGrath, who's one of our writers, credit for coming up with this idea that, well, what if she gets Dipper to break up for her? And I was like, okay, okay. It's not that she's a coward. It's just she really wants people to like her, and it hurts yeah. her to be mean. Yeah. So it's it's... And, and and once we kind of came up with that, I, I I added a few little details like sweater time was something I added to the script late. Run right. like, is there a Mabel-y way yeah. of being having a hard time saying no to somebody. So it's, it's, she's still herself. Uh, Matt Brawley storyboarded this scene and all this acting on Dipper's hands, like, haha, she's uh, kind of weirded out by you. No offense, that little arm. Yeah. That was, Matt, this was one of Matt's first scenes ever. Yeah. And I yeah. remember seeing that. I was like, that's perfect. 
Yeah, yeah like, he's really never captures... boarded professionally before. This is perfect yeah. character well, acting. Well, yeah. Also, it's very particular to Dipper. And yeah. Really yeah, encapsulates who he is. The, the other thing about this whole thing and why Mabel finds herself in a quandary, which I always bought, was that, that she actually likes Little Gideon. Yeah, yeah. He's she fun. actually he's fun. He's, she, a, yeah, he's, he's a, a fun guy. Fun. Yeah, I mean, and she expresses that in early in the episode, and that's one of the reasons why I buy she's having a hard time. hundred percent. Well, I, I recently rewatched this episode, and like, I really do think it works. Um, it, it, but it took some work getting there. Oh yeah, it was like yeah. it's it's not just that she's. Because she's not unconfident, yeah. But she wants to be loved, and she has a big heart. Well, that you know, you run across this problem in any show where the most confident character, the character that seems to know who they are and has no problem living in the world as they are, depend regardless of what the world thinks. Now of you got to give them a conflict. Yeah, it's really hard for those to build Arc stories thing. around those characters when all of a sudden they lose that. Like, yeah. Why? Why? Why do they lose it? Why do they lose the confidence that just seems to be such a part of their? Personality. You need an in-character way to do it. Um, I've talked yeah. in other episodes about end end act images. We try to start and end every mm -hmm. any act when we can with something that tells you the whole story. Particularly yeah. if you can cut on something that in one image tells you what's going to happen next. Yeah. Um, this is also a nod to continuity here, where Dipper tells Toby Determined, "Sorry for accusing you of murder last week." <laughs> These were often the very the, the, the very last lines mm -hmm. added to the episode because yeah. we were trying to. Link the it was an experiment at the time. There really hadn't been a kids show uh, that was a half hour kids show with this level of continuity that, that I that I can right. think of. No, um, we weren't allowed to do this kind of thing for a very, very long time. It was generally discouraged and we were experimenting with it, you know, now with binge watching shows and shows that are meant yeah. to be made all produced and then aired at the end like there's so much continuity. At the time, it was a major experiment, right? Um, and yeah. it took a lot of just constant attention to find little ways to make it feel connected and not just make it say like, "Oh yeah, Toby's forgiving and forgetting," you know? Yeah. And right. in this in this episode in particular, we were having a really hard time figuring out like what the big continuity hook at the end was going to be because yeah. we we wanted it to be like some amazing twist and turn at the end. But we, I remember there was this like emergency meeting, like this episode's about to go to air. Um, everyone write 12 ideas for what the end of the episode could be. And then I think it was Rob came up with the fact that he just has journal number two. And it was like yeah. really simple, but it was like, oh, that's, that's perfect. And it was so satisfying seeing fans like, oh my God, Gideon's got journal number There's two. There's live reaction videos on YouTube of people like screaming. Yeah. When they, well, just because it was so unheard of at this point, you right. know, particularly at this point in just television yeah. climate that a kid's show would give you that level of attention. Like and a would, comedy too. Comedy's yeah, that never in a that. comedy, you'd also mix it with some mystery and something that actually pays off. Right. Yeah. Well, I mean, originally we had like a mysterious shadowy figure talking to Gideon. Oh, That's yeah, right. That. And, and I remember all wrong. We, we, all pitched wrong. That, we pitched that to Eric Cole. Coleman, and he, I remember him like, like making a point of stopping and going like, you know, you guys are, you're you committing. Better now, know who right? that figure. You know, yeah. you know where you're going, right? <laughs> and, we and we're all know, like, we had no Ooh, idea who we it was. We don't know what we're I mean, doing. Well, we know, here's what we did know. What we knew was that what we what we knew is that there was. We knew that Stan had a twin brother who made the mystery shack. We knew that that brother got spirited away by some evil force. He got too close to the mysteries he was studying and that that evil force took him away yeah. and that he would need to be found somehow. Right. And that our thought was Gideon somehow connected to that same evil force. We didn't know it would be Bill for sure. We didn't know how the journals were connected. Right. Um, well, at one point we just thought, let me let me come in and, and uh, give myself credit. <laughs> as, I, as I remember... Feel free. As I remember, you had... you like We were like, well, does Dipper have a book? Will he, should he have a book? And there was a big debate about that, and we, we, we danced all this, as long as we could. And then we had that big meeting, and I thought, I, I'm the one who said, like, yes, Dipper has a book, and Gideon has a book, and Stan has a book. Yeah, There are three right. books. Yeah, 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 I remember and that. And that was the, that I, was I think the, I remember that. That was the key. That was yeah. the, I mean, that was like, now we knew what, we knew what the device was. We knew yeah. what the MacGuffin was, kind of, which is the journals, which, yeah. you know. Yeah. Well, and I, I mean, I remember, because you're right, the, the, the actual journal, as we know it, was not in the original pilot I created. Uh, there was there a, was a book. There was a monster manual, but in an important series of journals did not exist at that point. And, I mean, I was... I always thought that was a fantastic addition to the show. Like, I yeah. was stoked on that idea. Um, like, but it was a question of, like, how are we going to pay this off, right? Like, yeah. Yeah. Um, this whole sequence boarded really well. Matt Brawley, again, like... And this is... I, I really like Dipper and Mabel's relationship in this episode, where yeah. he's willing to help her out with her problem. N no problem. She immediately defends her brother the moment he's in trouble. Yeah. Right. Um, like, it's, it's a really great bond between them in this show. And it, and it reminds me of, like, 
like me and my sister, like when she had problems, like I was like, I can't I help? Like we'd fight and then the moment somebody else would be a jerk to the either one, it was like immediately, nope, you, oh, nobody talks to my sister that way. <laughs> yeah. Um, that was a Matt, Bra- Matt Brawley addition, this idea that she's right in front of the moon hovering like yeah, that, that, like that cool. she's in the power position. Yeah. We really wanted her to be completely in control by the end of the episode. And there, there was part of the inspiration with Gideon having a crush on Mabel was in preschool, there was a kid who was in love with my sister. I remember this from preschool. Um, and he brought in a little a, a, a ring pop to propose marriage to her. Wonderful. And you took a crystal and broke him. <laughs> <laughs> well, and she was, she had a hard, she was like creeped out by him. And, yeah. but she did, she was being nice and giving her gifts and she didn't want to be mean, you know? Well, hey, Gideon, look what. Stand for pines, I rebuke thee. I rebuke thee. Rebuke? Is that a word? <laughs> <laughs> that, that Stan's response to Gideon yes. here came from, I was reading the script and Gideon was using this highfalutin language. I was like, Stan wouldn't like that slide. <laughs> you got a word of day calendar? Uh, <laughs> Mr. A, Harvard? I what, said, how old are you? <laughs> I once said 10 minutes ago, cracked me up. Uh, Steven Root, uh, voice oh, of yeah. Bud Gleeful. Amazing, amazing, amazing he's actor. He's the best. He's in so many things. He's, he's in comedy. He's in drama. He's, he's in the, Coen Brothers movies. He's in Coen Brothers movies. He's the stapler guy from Office Space. Um, and he's just sweet and kind yeah. and humble and just a pro. You bring yeah. him in, you show him the lines, and he just nails it immediately. Yeah. yeah. I could have had it all. Uh, <laughs> what the heck happened? The sequence done by Alonzo again. This, this, I remember the first boards of this were so rough and scribbly. Um, but they had so much life yeah. in them. Yeah. Like this idea that Stan leaps on the kids and they're all yeah. roughhousing on the yeah. couch. It was that, just so sweet. Yeah. I love the physicality and the inner physical interaction that Alonzo always had between the characters because I feel like that's something that's real that you sometimes don't see in cartoons. Sometimes forget. Yeah. Like, you, you know, people well, touch each other. People that care for each other touch each other and, and mess with each other in this way. Yeah. That kind of, that was all done really well. <laughs> there we go. Gideon is so creepy. Yeah. This is <laughs> so weirdly over the top. We reveal fantastic. the we reveal the uh, the extent. I'm old and smelly. <laughs> that was just a thorough uh, imp- improv. Hey, what are you gonna do? <laughs> <laughs> His Dipper impression. And there it is. Oh! Right now, Rob runs that he's doing a victory lap around the office. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> we better figure out what the journals are. <laughs> oh, this is great. I like this tag. Yeah. It's fun. <laughs> I don't know who did it. I love it. And this is like, um, this was, I think, Brad Brink's first um, attempt at a theme song for the... Uh, oh, no. This, oh. That was a different theme. But this was one of Brad's early yeah. pieces. That, this oh, is yeah. very Brad He did Brink. such a good job. It's yeah. It's a a lot when there's fun. synth, thank Brad. Yeah. <laughs> You're all nuts. Nice. 